Perfect. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get started with a, um, a short talk about um, about MedVR, uh, and uh, it, I, I promise it, it will be be short. Um, let me share my screen here. There we are. And let us know when we're live. Okay, uh, we're 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 live right right now. Oh yay! Great. So here we are. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to the MedVR Innovation in, in Medical Extended Reality Talk Series. Uh, we're, we're focused on uh, the innovator uh, and the needs of the innovator to, uh, uh, for the people at Build for the spectrum of um, uh, uh, solutions for healthcare, uh, ranging from men mental health to surgery. Uh, just a little bit of background, um, and when you, as I go through my slides, uh, it'll become obvious to you that I'm an engineer uh, and not a designer. Um, so, why are we not moving? Ah, there it is. Okay. Um, MedVR is a 501c3 nonprofit educational uh, institution. Uh, we spun out of the MIT Media Lab and uh, the USC XR hackathons uh, that, uh, that I ran for, for a number of years. Uh, we, um, uh, we collected over uh, 300 prototypes uh, uh, of, um, of XR applications, not all healthcare, uh, but we're now focused uh, specifically on uh, the innovation process, um, uh, which we needed to e expand upon. And what we want to do, what, what, our, what our KPIs are, are to increase the number of people in the medical and technical community that understand innovation in medical XR. Uh, this is um, uh, really to expand uh, the, 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 the the number, uh, the, the number of, of new projects every year as well uh, that are created and, and even more important, we wanna focus on, uh, on, the, on the pipeline of projects that, that continue in development, are incubated, receive grant funding and commercial in, in investment. Um, uh, the medical field uh, ha is, a, is a wonderful environment both for uh, the alt altruistic um, um, uh, reason of improving health, uh, and at the same time, uh, because it's it's evidence based, the problem statements tend to be be very very good. Uh, in 2002, uh, MedVR will begin delivering an interdisciplinary boot boot camp training medical and technical professionals to innovate with medical XR, and we're we're looking forward to growing that. Uh, uh, to run three cohorts a year through through the, the, the boot camp. Um, we're seed funding, we're hiring, uh, we're, we're raising money. Uh, we have solid partners um, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the community, uh, which has uh, been, a, been a big help to us. Um, and um, now on to the, to the program that I'm so, so, so excited about. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the Food and Drug Administration um, ha has been extremely proactive, um, and I, I thought that it was important for uh, innovators, um, researchers, designers, developers, pro product developers, um, uh, to understand more about um, uh, about their their activity. Uh, I'm delighted that um, Dr. Ryan Beams uh, from the FDA uh, uh, agreed to uh, uh, to give a talk, and um, uh, doubly excited that uh, Dr. Walter Greenfield from Stanford uh, will 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 moderate. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Greenleaf has uh, uh, one of the few people that have had uh, three decades of experience in this in, in this field and. Uh, that there's the few and far far be far between. Um, uh, to uh, whoop, got ahead of myself here. 
Um, uh, Walter is a neuroscientist and medical technology de developer working at uh, Stanford University. Uh, as I said, three decades of research. Um, he's worked in, um, uh, in many different areas of digital health technology to treat uh, post-traumatic stress, anxiety disorders, stroke addiction, autism, and other difficult problems in, in behavior and, and physical medicine. Uh, he is a, uh, he held a principal role in pioneering medical product companies, including Pair Therapeutics, Virtual Better, Mind Maze, and In-World Solutions. Uh, Walter is currently a distinguished visiting scholar at Stanford University's MediaX program, a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, and the Director of Technology Strategy at the University of Colorado National Mental Health Innovation Center. He previously served as the director of the Mind Division, Stanford Center uh, on Longevity, where his focus was on age-related changes in cognition. Walter was the founding chief science officer for Pair Therapeutics and is currently uh, the chief science officer for Interaxin. Uh, Walter's a, a member of the board of directors for Brainstorm, uh, the Stanford Laboratory of, of Brain Health Innovation, uh, uh, for sine wave and for cognitive leap. leap. Uh, uh, and that's, um, uh, 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 Walter, it, it will, uh, will moderate the, the, the talk and um, uh, we'll ask some questions and we'll also, um, uh, we'll also help uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of the audience's questions get, get answered. Uh, one thing to take note is on the bottom of your screen, uh, there's both the chat button uh, and there's also a questions button. The chat button is, is uh, for the community chat. If you have a question, uh, you should uh, put it in, in the question uh, chat, chat box uh, so that they'll, they'll be all, all together. Uh, we'll uh, go through the talk uh, and then start to answer questions um, and uh, we'll wrap up uh, by uh, uh, by 1:15 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, Daylight Savings Time. So last but not least is uh, upcoming events. Uh, the HOAG Advances in Clinical Virtual Reality uh, starts this uh, uh, this Friday, October 1. Um, if you're interested, um, uh, take a look at the the website. Uh, um, uh, HOAG.org uh, uh, slash VR 2021. Uh, and then the International Virtual Reality Healthcare Association me meetings. Um, uh, the third annual Virtual Reality Healthcare Europe Symposium in, in Dublin uh, is in uh, December. Uh, I just read something, Ireland is 90% vaccinated. Uh, so it looks like it's a safe place uh, to, to, to go. Um, I had uh, had second thoughts and, and um, uh, assuaged uh, my my thoughts of uh, of, of travel, uh, and then the sixth annual virtual reality and healthcare global symposium at Vanderbilt University in in, in Nashville, Tennessee is com com coming up. Uh, so uh, take take a look at uh, those those programs uh, ibrha.org uh, and. Um, uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll hopefully see see you there. So um, uh, thank you, Walter. It's over to you, and uh, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll I'll leave it to you from here. Well, thank you, thank you, Steve, and very excited to be here. Thank you for the kind words. I I almost uh, interrupted you when you were uh, giving my background because it's really not very important for this conversation. Um, what's more important is that we have some time to hear. Um, from from Ryan, I'm particularly excited to, to have this uh, opportunity uh, as I work with many of the academic and seed early stage um, um, companies that are jumping in and doing fantastic work developing um, clinical VR products. Uh, one of the most common questions I get, one of the largest concerns is uh, how do we address regulatory approval? Now, many of these companies are, are very young, haven't had the experience before, and they're they're concerned about both the cost and the time and the distraction involved, and also not clear, you know, are, are what we're developing is it a, is it necessary to go through review by the FDA, or is it uh, 
something that we should position more on the consumer side? What's most appropriate? So, uh, Ryan, so glad to have your guidance here. Uh, uh, to our listeners, um, um, I'll ask Ryan to go into a little bit of detail about his background uh, to the extent he'd like to, but I'm, I'm impressed that he comes to us with a background in uh, uh, optical physics. Uh, I think as we look at uh, the affordances and uh, uh, abilities that uh, the VR and AR systems are providing to us, it, one of the fundamental issues is that interface with our visual system. So uh, uh, it seems very appropriate that, that Ryan is here and looking forward to hearing your presentation, Ryan. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm excited to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Are you seeing the presentation or the, the background? Uh, I'm seeing the presentation, um, Medical Center Reality Applications. Okay. And Excellent. Yeah, I can see it too. Um, great. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. My name is Ryan Beams. And to give you a little bit of um, structure that might help understand, so I work in the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, and this is the research arm for the Center for Device and Radio Radiological Health. So we like to say we wear two hats. One side is we help with the review process for new devices. And the other hat is that we do regulatory science to try to be prepared for devices that are coming that haven't arrived. Um, and so my talk's going to do a little bit of both. Hopefully, as um, Walter mentioned, it'll remove some of the mystery behind the FDA and help people get some resources for how they can go about um, bringing devices to market. And then also talk a some about some of the challenges and research we're doing in this space. All right, so a quick disclaimer. Um, I'll just skip through that. So to give a little bit of the framework, so as everyone on this call is very aware, there's a lot of different application areas for AR and VR devices in medicines. And so on this slide, I'm just highlighting a few of them. And one thing that's important is each of these devices have gone through the FDA process already. And so there's the uh, reference numbers, which I'll show you how to look those up shortly. But anyway, these applications are ranging from visualization, surgery planning, rehabilitation, and even to interoperative. And with each of these application areas, there's of course unique challenges um, and unique aspects that you want the device to, to have to be able to show that they're safe and effective. Okay, so from a regulatory standpoint, what are some of the challenges that we see with these devices? And I think this also is part of why they're exciting is a new technology. And so there's a lot of text here, um, but one is, which I already highlighted on the previous slide, is these can be used for a huge range of applications. And I think that's a lot of why people are interested in this. I like to think of it as an enabling technology, so it's not specific for one particular application, but you can apply it across this wide range. Um, there's also a wide range in environmental usages, ranging anywhere from at home or telemedicine to interoperative. Um, it's also being used both on patients and with medical professionals, which is also, I think, quite unique. And then from the standpoint, I think, of smaller companies, it's also a little bit challenging because the hardware that's available is evolving and changing very quickly. And so one part of that is the standards communities for how to develop evaluation methods are also constantly having to work to play catch up with the changes in these devices. So just to um, kind of really drive home the point, so the importance of the indication for use or the applications for these devices, you can take a look in the um, literature and, and look at the HTC Vive, and you can very easily find a wide range of applications. So this is the same hardware being used for three different, very different application areas. And of course, what you would want the hardware to do and what the performance requirements would be very different depending on these applications. So I think that's one area that makes it both exciting and challenging. So to go in a little more detail, um, so here's an example of some of the types of performance questions that we're looking at. It's not a comprehensive list, just to kind of get the flavor. Um, so there's of course a lot of optical questions that come up. And as Walter said, that's one of the main interfaces between the user 
and the device is the optical component. So that's, um, we have a lot of questions and um, areas of concern as far as the image quality. And then I'm also highlighting starring ones that are currently in process in standard in standards groups. So another way you can think about this, instead of breaking it down by technology, is instead think about it in terms of application. So for instance, if we're thinking about only for maybe visualization, there would be some testing involved, but it wouldn't be nearly as extensive as what would be required for interoperative use because the risk is this. Similarly, therapy has also a unique set of um, issues that would come up there. And of course, what would be relevant for say human factors could be different for each of these as well. So um, the slides should be available. So I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. This is just some examples of some excerpts from cleared devices and it, just going a little more detail than the pictures I provided earlier about different devices. And we'll talk about a couple of them in more detail, um, ranging from rehabilitation, visualization, and interoperative. And the link to go to the publicly available information, which will include uh, more information than's here, is um, available at this link. So I'm going to talk about three examples to give a little bit of a, a feel of some of the devices that are on the market. Um, so one of them is Penumbra. And so you can look that one up here. And so here's the indication for use for this one. So this is intended to be used for rehabilitation. Um, and then as a part of that, there was of course, some performance testing that was required to show that it's safe and effective. Okay, a fairly different application. So this is uh, CENTIAR, and this is intended to be used for um, interoperative use and for EP procedures. So it's a really different application than the um, rehabilitation I showed on the previous slide. And as you can see, there's some overlap with the performance data, but there's also a lot of unique um, aspects to this device, including in this case, a clinical study. And again, the information for that one can be found here. Um, the last one I wanted to just really briefly highlight, um, and I know I'm going through these files pretty quickly, is Augmetics. So this is an um, augmented reality headset that is used to show stereotactic information um, and it's used for place, the placement of pedicle screws. And there's a few things that are important to notice with this. So one is that this is the stereotactic system is still in place and there's the addition of this headset. And so that brings down the risk um, with this device. And then you can see, for instance, that the standard of care with a conventional monitor is still maintained. And then kind of similar to the last device, there's um, a number of tests that were performed on this. Okay, so now I'm gonna go briefly through some resources and talk about them. And hopefully this will help give people a little bit of an idea of what's involved with getting to the point of some of these files that I talked about where they have um, an FDA clear device. So the first thing, so I'm gonna give a lot of resources here. Um, I would encourage people that are interested in this to go to the website and read the documentation that's provided. First thing I want to mention that um, I think there's often some confusion is the difference between registering a device, having a cleared device. So there is a registration process, which is generally required for medical device companies. But as you can see, and I just took this straight from the FDA webpage, it does not denote approval. So that's kind of a different that does not show that you've gone through one of the regulatory processes and your device um, can be legally marketed for a particular indication for you. So I would encourage people to take a look at that. And then one thing that's um, also important when thinking through the um, process is depending on the device and what the risks are, changes what the regulatory pathway is. So if it's a low risk, it's going to be, there's going to be a different burden than if it's a high risk device. And then finally, because this comes up sometimes too, if people are interested in the cost for doing, submitting a device to the FDA, that can also be found here. So I think this slide is probably the most important for thinking about if you have a device and you're wondering, should this go to the FDA? If so, 
in what form, how do I go about doing that? All those type of questions. The QSUB program is one that I think is a, is a fantastic resource. It's a free submission and it gives you the opportunity to come to the FDA with a panel of experts and ask your questions. So um, this could be things ranging from, am I selecting the appropriate pre uh, predicate device? Do we need to do clinical trials? Is this the right regulatory pathway for our device? So all of these type of questions, and you can get that feedback to know how you should proceed through the regulatory process. So I really can't emphasize, overemphasize how useful this is, I think for companies as they're thinking about what to do with the product. Um, a few other resources I think are pretty useful is you can look up, um, and this is where I was pulling the information earlier, you can look up previously cleared devices, and this will give you an idea of what, um, what documentation is out there, what are the indications for use for these devices, and kind of tease out some of the current thinking um, that's going into this. And then there's also a number of guidances that are available, and so I just put the human factors one here because it's something that's um, more relevant to this space. All right, so that wraps up the kind of brief regulatory uh, overview. And so now I will go on to the next slide. So if we remember a few slides back, I highlighted that there's a lot of different um, indications for use, application areas, and performance questions that come up with using AR and VR devices in the medical space. And so we've set up a research program to try to start tackling some of those issues. And so this is a graphical table of contents of some of the research programs that we currently have going on. So we're looking at the, the rendering process because you have to take that medical image and somehow bring it onto the headset. So we're looking at color performance um, and other aspects in that. And I'll talk about that in more detail. Of course, image quality, and then finally, once you've done all that, it needs to go on a person and it needs to perform well in that situation. So also um, a number of applications in human factors related to rehabilitation and also surgery. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight a few of the technical evaluation challenges that, that we've been thinking about um, and some of the um, ways we're trying to approach them. So the first thing I want to mention is there's still, the hardware is, I think has made an incredible progress in recent years, but there's still limitations. So here's a plot on the vertical axis of angular resolution and across the horizontal axis is the field. Of, and ideally we'd want to be out where this red arrow is for the human eye where we have very high angular resolution over a huge field of view. From an optics standpoint, that's really hard to do. And if we even just think about where, what a display would need to be capable of, we're talking about something around like an 8K display, which then brings up other issues as far as heat dissipation, having the rendering engine that can handle this. Um, so it's a really challenging engineering problem. And then some of the current device on the market land more like in this space. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. So, um, one thing that's also important to think about both with the design of the devices and with measuring them is the human eye is different than a camera. Um, so there's a very narrow fovea region that you have high resolution. And so this actually gives a potential way forward with mitigating the compute requirements because you can start thinking about foveated rendering and things like that. But that also raises, I think, some performance questions about how does changing the content in the periphery impact tasks such as um, search or immersion or a number of these other issues that could be relevant for medical applications. And then the last thing is, which from an optics standpoint is pretty important, is the to be able to see the whole field of view, the eye rotates. This isn't too surprising, but one thing that's important with that is that means as the eye moves, it moves off of the, at the optical of the head mounted display, which can change the image quality depending on where the users look. Um, so to give a little more detail on that, so if we think about image quality and head mounted displays, ideally we want to have this lens that focuses something down to a point. 
Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. You're uh, you're oscillating uh, between uh, soft and loud. Um, it might be positional, or it might be the the jack on a microphone, or or, or something that uh, might. And hopefully, it's not the internet. Uh, well, I saw a warning a second ago about the internet. Let me double check my settings. So is it then difficult to hear? It, it's just that you drop to very soft um, um, uh, every um, uh, a couple times a minute. Okay, that looks okay. Um, do you want me to try switching headphones, or I can? I I think you're I think you're getting through well enough. Um, okay. With what? Just maybe maybe um, maybe speak a little louder for the for when it drops out. But I think uh, I think we'd lose too much time switching headphones. Okay, I'll just continue and try to talk louder. Hopefully, it's better. Um, all right, so with, uh, with these headsets, they try to basically have a very compact, lightweight lens, and that ends up introducing other issues with the uh, image quality. So um, for instance, you can, instead of having this ideal focus, you can have different types of distortion and aberrations. So here's a kind of a pictorial example of what you could see looking um, through one of the headsets due to different aberrations. So instead of having a nice crisp spot, depending on where you're looking in the field of view, um, you can have say colors splitting apart, you can have blurring at the edges of the field of view or even these type of cone shapes. All right, so now I'll talk about a few of the image quality evaluations that we're working on and some of the challenges. Um, so one of them, which I think was kind of highlighted on the previous slide is the image quality varies across the field of view. So here's an example of a radiographic image and initially it looks nice and then you bring it onto the headset and then you get this pixelation. And then depending on where you're looking, you get different amounts of change in contrast and resolution. So you can actually um, see that here with some measurements that we've done looking at how the contrast changes depending on the, um, the feature size that you're looking at on the headset. So as the features get smaller, the contrast for that feature drops off. Um, another feature we've um, spent some time investigating is looking at chromatic aberration for these devices. So here's an example for a digital pathology. So if we start with this whole slide image, and then this is just done using, um, using MATLAB as an illustration. You can apply different amounts of chromatic aberration. So what this does is basically it um, applies a different magnification to the different color channels and then stretches it or squishes it depending on what color you're looking at. So if you zoom in on say just this 4% case, you end up with this rainbowing effect for the RGB um, which then could impact, say, a pathologist's ability to identify a feature of interest. Um, and so we studied this on a headset, and what we found is that just in, in the center, you can have these bars that alternate and look nice, and then as you go to the edge, they actually start overlapping. So you get a pretty different image at the edge compared to at the center. And then we looked at that for a number of different headsets, and so you can really characterize how the um, how this chromatic aberration changes across uh, the field of view. So then a, a question with that is, okay, so you've measured this, but can anyone see this? Is this noticeable? And probably most people who put on the headsets are already thinking, yes, it's noticeable, I've seen it. Um, so we did a real simple task to just have users move the red and blue bars until they thought they were lined up with the green bars and use that to measure what chromatic aberration different users were seeing. And so what we ended up finding is this dashed line is what we got from the bench measurements. And then these are the cases for different users with the bars at different spots in the field of view. And so even for users, this is something that's pretty noticeable within um, even within 10 degrees of the field of view. 
And next thing I wanted to mention is along the same lines, but in addition to changes in the like chromatic aberration, it's also resolution changes that you get across the field of view. So here's just looking real simple demonstration, uh, single pixel white lines at different spots. And then if you look at say the center of the field of view versus off by some number of degrees, you get this blurring out of these lines um, indicating that the resolution is decreased. So we analyze this a bit more um, by basically just looking at the profile of these white lines. And so you start out with something sharp and then it ends up blurred out. And we did this experiment for both the Vive and the Vive Pro. And um, the question we're kind of interested in is to what extent is having more pixels improve the image quality, help with the resolution? So just to orient you along the horizontal axis is the field of view. And the vertical axis is the width of this, um, of this line, how much it's blurred out. So in the center, it's pretty good. And then as you go out in the field of view, you can see it starts to broaden and kind of smear out. And interestingly, if you do the same thing on the Vive Pro, the resolution in the center of the field of view is definitely better as you'd expect due to the higher pixel count. But once you get off in the field of view, the, um, having the additional pixels actually doesn't help too much. And so this is due to basically the limitations of the, um, of the lens in this device. Okay, um, so I mentioned earlier, so once we've figured out everything we need to know about the image quality due to the optics, we still have to take the medical images from um, some initial data set and bring them onto the headset. And so this was just exploring different ways of using Unity and how, how you can change the contrast and image quality depending on what settings you use and how you go about doing that. So it's really kind of just a um, caution or a comment for as, you, as companies are thinking about bringing this medical image in, how do you do that and how do you make sure that the final image has the same um, the same properties as what you sent in in the first place. And so the references for all these are at the bottom of the slides. Okay, another aspect that we're um, starting to work on, but there's a lot more to do, is beyond just looking at how things look spatially, often you want to, use, there's motion involved. This could be the user moving, this could be looking at videos, there's a lot of ways that motion can be added in, and then which can add other effects to the image quality. So this was um, a paper just kind of looking at some of these different aspects and how we can start to understand and characterize them. Okay, the next one I, I wanna talk about is some ongoing research that we have looking at um, the contrast of augmented reality in bright ambient lighting. So ideal case, you may want to do surgery planning where you take this medical image, overlay it, register it to the patient, and then say have this green line where you're planning to maybe make an incision on this spot. And so ideally you want to be able to take a real world image, combine a virtual object, and have both of them clear and easy to see for the surgeon. The reality though, is you often get something a little bit more like this because you have the bright ambient lighting that ends up washing out the virtual content and you get this kind of um, ghost kind of effect. And so really the focus of this research is we're trying to look at um, how to evaluate the contrast that you have for the virtual image and then also how well can you still see the surgical field if you've overlaid a bright vir uh, virtual image. And I'll return to this a little bit more in a minute as I start talking about some of the human factors issues. Okay, another one that, um, yeah, I just mentioned really briefly, but thinking about also the image quality as a function of interpupillary distance, because really this needs to be set up and designed to match the visual system of the individual. So here's just an example using uh, bench measurements with a camera where I first positioned the camera lined up at an interpupillary distance of 62 and then moved it off to something that's a little closer to what I see when I look through some of the headsets. And you can see you get a pretty significant change in resolution. And I think one area this also comes up, I think that's kind of important is there's 
there's some interest in being able to use these devices with um, younger with younger patients where their heads haven't fully developed and their interpupillary distance can actually be quite a bit smaller than where headsets are designed. All right. Um, and the last kind of bench testing one I wanted to mention that we're working on is looking at motion tracking. And so this comes up both in the context of rehabilitation and then also for fine finer motion in surgical applications. This project right now is focused on rehabilitation. And the basic idea is to take a look at the performance of the sensors that are built into these devices and compare them to more gold standard type methods that are uh, more accurate and used in other industries. So to really try to get some methodologies for how to understand how well these sensors perform for different tasks. All right, so now I'm gonna highlight a few different human factors challenges that we're looking at for um, AR VR devices. First one, and so this is all work that's being um, done by primarily by Eleanor Brown within our program. Um, and so the first one I wanna mention is thinking about cognitive load. So there's an obvious benefit of being able to, if we look at this case here, of bringing the medical images right where the surgeon can see them where they're working so that they're not having to turn and look in a different location. But of course, this also has concerns about how much information is too much, where should it be placed, what color should it be, and what are the cognitive loads by bringing extra information into the surgical field. Another one is looking at um, perceptual issues. So here's one that um, probably everyone's very familiar with. Um, so thinking about vergence and accommodation, so if you have a natural object where you can, you've, your eyes rotate and they focus to see the object. But for most currently available head mounted displays, that's not the case. You can move this object um, in virtual space back and forth, but where that virtual plane is stays fixed. So the eye um, focus stays constant, but the angle changes. And so this ends up causing a conflict with the perceptual system. So here's an example of a paper that was published um, a couple of years ago, just having people do like a connect the dots type experiment using an augmented reality headset. And then due to this conflict, there were some performance issues. And so from a usability and risk standpoint, this can lead to things like eye fatigue. It also could impact the accuracy with which you can perform certain tasks. Um, another challenge that um, we're looking at is, the, is how physical loads impact things. So you have this headset, you put it on, and depending on the ergonomics and how that's been designed, that can also cause additional um, risks as far as the comfort of the, either the physician or the patient, say, undergoing rehabilitation. And then the last one I want to highlight is we're also looking at some of the human factors issues related to that surgical application I mentioned earlier. So in this case, this is um, looking at EVD procedure where you have, um, where you place a catheter into the ventricle to drain off fluid. And typically this is done in a bedside manner right now without image guidance to help. And so here's a few different papers where people have looked at how you can use augmented reality to improve the accuracy of these performances. And so we're looking at taking basically that contrast study that I mentioned earlier and looking at it in this, this use case to understand the human factors issues with it. And so here's basically the idea is developing um, a phantom and then doing different user studies while also doing the motion capture to understand the different um, human factors issues with this. And then the last one I want to mention is we have kind of some ongoing work on rehabilitation um, that Eleanor and Kimberly are working on. And so this is looking at different things, including we're trying to get some work started on looking at cyber sickness and also tying into the motion tracking type measurements to understand um, some of the rehabilitation issues. All right, with that, that actually wraps up 
um, most of what I wanted to talk about. So I know it was kind of a lot of content to cover very briefly, but hopefully it gave people a little bit of the flavor of both the regulatory process, how you can get some of that information that you might need, and also the research that we're doing. And then the last thing I'm going to mention is two community efforts, because there's, um, there's a lot of challenges in this area. And so one is we're in the process of trying in collaboration with University of Maryland and University of Michigan, starting up a, um, a UICRC. And then the other one is we've also started an MDIC working group. Um, and we have a number of working uh, subgroups in this to start looking with the larger community at how we can evaluate um, AR and VR devices in this space. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to take a look at the website and sign up, or you can email me because we would love to have more involvement. And with that, I will conclude. And here's a couple, couple more references. And thank you all for your attention. And I look forward to the questions. Ryan, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I think you covered uh, a large amount of ground, 37 slides in uh, uh, about as many minutes and going into a great balanced amount of detail. So thank you very much. And it, it is also, I think, uh, so important for people to have an understanding of the spectrum of issues that um, uh, need to be addressed. Uh, many of the academic groups and, and businesses that are developing medical VR uh, applications uh, see things from the constraints that they have as they develop a product and concerns about validating both the safety and the efficacy of those products, but they often don't see from a broader perspective some of the issues such as resolution for motion tracking or uh, size of the head mount display and how that met, might affect the uh, uh, the appropriateness of this, of using it with different uh, uh, age groups. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, you and your agency are, are um, jumping in to help come up with the uh, knowledge uh, that will help you help us develop the best products. So thank you so much for your effort. And uh, we're going to take some questions now uh, that if you post them in the uh, chat window, uh, uh, Ryan, will, I'll, I'll help put them in front of Ryan and he can focus on giving the, the best answers. But uh, why don't I start out by posing one question. Um, I think that as people are looking at the ways of moving forward with VR and AR technology, many of the groups that are developing clinical applications tend to focus on, um, they, they tend to forget about the enabling technology per se. They're, they're focused more on the uh, how it's being used by the clinician or by the patient. And I think in the case of things that involve um, cognitive processes, um, uh, applications of mental health and behavioral health, it almost starts to seem like we forget about the aspects of the technology. So how does a developer um, keep in front of them the concerns that a regulatory agency might have about the use of a technology as opposed to a content or an algorithm or a clinical process. Does, should the developers think about, um, is the head mount display um, been reviewed and can I just um, not pay attention to that aspect of it or should they keep in mind as they apply to work with uh, uh, your agency, uh, Ryan, the, the aspects of the technology itself. Um, uh, can you give us some guidance on how best to think about that? And I realize it's a complex question and we have only a short amount of time, but in general, um, how, yeah. how, do you, how, how does one consider that? And I, and I so suppose the answer is it depends. <laughs> that is the answer, but I'll try to give you more than that. Um, that's a great question. And I think it's particularly challenging because a lot of companies are are using off-the-shelf hardware from someone else, right? There's not a lot of companies that are making their own hardware for these particular uses. So it's, I mean, it's possible the company doesn't even necessarily know the answer to some of those questions that I was talking about. Um, so I think it's, it's important to view it as an entire device. So there's software components, there's hardware components, and thinking about it more 
in its entirety, I think is very important. Um, as far as to what extent should companies be thinking about those specifics, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the performance of one headset can be different than the performance of another. And I know that sounds very, very obvious, um, but I think that's something important to keep in mind, particularly when maybe deciding on what headset you're gonna develop for or something like that. The other thing, which I know I mentioned earlier, is if it's early and you want, and a company wants to get an idea of what types of performance issues should we be thinking about for this device, um, submitting a Q-sub and coming and talking to us is a great idea because it could be some of the testing a company is thinking about maybe isn't needed and there might be other things that are needed. So I think the earlier companies get that information, I think it just makes everyone's life easier. Following up on the Q-sub process, I'm sure that um, some of members of our audience are wondering, um, is there a cost involved in going through that process? And if I do uh, start that process, does the dialogue I have um, have impact on uh, how I'm reviewed? Um, uh, you know, maybe go a little bit more in detail about uh, how that part works. Yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's free. Um, and so the way this typically works is a company will submit their QSUB, which will give some information about their device. And this can range really all across the board as far as depending on where the company is in their development cycle. And then they'll have a list of questions that they want the FDA to answer. So thinking through like what, what questions you have is really important. Um, and then, so there's, there's usually a review process of that, answers are provided, and then generally there's a, like, there's a meeting after that with the company to go over the answers. They can ask for more clarification because um, I think the, the clearer it is, the communication is between the FDA and that company, the better and smoother it's going to be when they come in with their device submission. Fantastic. Here's, a, here's another one of those questions that the answer will be, it depends, but maybe you can give a few exemplars. Uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of the questions from, from our audience is, uh, how long has the process, will the process approximately take, for example, for a 510K? Yeah, that one maybe, is maybe actually the answer. What, what an F, F, a 510K uh, application yeah. is, actually. Yeah, um, so we have different pathways for devices, and that depends, again, what I mentioned earlier about the classification and the risk. It also depends, well, okay, let me start with the 510K before we start talking about what's not a 510K. A 510K can be thought of as sort of a, almost like a Me Too application. So you can find a device that's, that's marketed already, that's gone through the FDA clearance process, that is very similar to what you're doing as far as the indication for use. So, um, and that was part of why I was highlighting some of the devices earlier. So if you have an application, say in rehabilitation, and it's pretty similar to Penumbra, then that could be um, a predicate device. And then if you can show that your device has substantially equivalent performance to that device, then it can be marketed. That's a very short version. Um, but sometimes, depending on the device, it, it could be that it's something very novel and there's not anything out there that really lines up as far as the technology or what the company is trying to do. And then you can't find a device to compare it to. And so in that case, there would be other pathways that it could go down and that would depend on the risk profile. So, oh, but I didn't actually answer the question. 510K is 90 days. Um, with the caveat that there sometimes can be, um, they can be put on hold. So for instance, if there's a lot of testing or something that the, um, the company is gonna need to do, then that, that 90 day clock can be paused to give them the chance to do the measurements they need to do before coming back. But yeah, the short answer is 90 days. That's actually not very long to uh, mm -hmm. as a review process. Uh, and, uh, um, I think the other general question, and it's also uh, not, it's going to depend on uh, the degree of, an, of um, uh, rigor that's needed because of whether there's a comparable through a 510K or whether it's something that safety and efficacy is a major concern because it 
um, has a, a direct impact on um, uh, a diagnosis or on a measurement that involves um, uh, being intrusive to the body. But uh, I think the early the early uh, people into the field are going to wonder what's what's the cost? Is this something that's going to be in the ten million dollar zone or the twenty thousand dollar zone? Um, and again, I know uh, Ryan, I'm putting you on the spot to. It, it, the answer is going to depend on exactly what's being submitted, but I think a little bit of sizing might help our audience understand uh, um, and make that decision to go down the uh, process of review as opposed to staying on the health and wellness side of the equation. Yeah, so I, um, I don't have those numbers memorized, but I did provide the link in an earlier slide. It gives a table to break down the cost of the different pathways. So I think that would probably be the the best um, the best resource for that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. And uh, let me, uh, uh, we do have a question in the uh, Q&A section of the chat window here. It, it says, if a company is looking to develop a software application, is it acceptable to list minimum requirements for an HMD, a headset, or do they need to apply with a specific headset as part of the submission? So that's a, that's a great question. I can certainly understand why the company is asking, because if you've developed everything for one headset and then it goes off the market, what does that mean for you? Um, unfortunately, that's not one I could really answer now without knowing more about what the specific application is. But I mean, that's, that's certainly a really good question. And it's one that we're aware of can be a challenge for companies. Okay, another question we have is, what kind of information will the FDA need from a manufacturer for um, OTC products for an application? Can any of this be substituted for data from studies? Uh, I think it's a very similar question to the one that you just, uh, you just answered. Yeah, I think I would need, um, that one also I would need more information um, to be able to answer. And generally the um, just kind of broad strokes. So the, the regulatory decisions get made by, by a team. Um, so if there's say a, um, someone has a surgical planning device they want to, they would, it would get submitted to the appropriate um, office within the review side. They would put together a team. It would get reviewed, discussed internally, and then feedback. So um, I think that's part of also why having that, the, the, the pre-submission or the Q-submission is important because in this, this kind of context, it's, it's not really possible to answer the questions without the full, the full file. So I know that's not very satisfying, but um, I think that's um, kind of, yeah, I would need more information for that one. Okay, we have another question. Um... Do training applications in uh, XR in healthcare also need uh, FDA approval? And I think this gets to the heart of um, the issue of making a claim. And maybe we should spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, the question specifically is, what about training applications? And um, and again, perhaps describe a little bit, Ryan, about the, the issue of making a claim uh, related to uh, a medical product. Yeah, so that's this is a good question too. So we so the FDA does not regulate like um, I have to be careful. So so like educational type applications, that's not something we would regulate. Training, I would say it also generally no, but that again, like you said, with the claims, that's going to depend. So if it's if it's part of like the training process for using a device in a particular application, um, it's possible. Um, but yeah, I think it would it would depend on kind of what the device is intended to be used for and hearing more of the specifics. But I would say in general, the training and education, um, no, that's not something that would get reviewed by the FDA. I suppose, though, and, and maybe use this as, an, as a um, jumping out point to talk about the issue of making a claim and, and what, uh, what the concerns are. If somebody were to have a training application, but 
let's say it's training a patient on um, um, diabetic care, um, just as an example. And the claim was using our product improves uh, uh, your lifespan by 20% or helps reduce the, uh, the probability that you have this problem. And they're making claims about uh, efficacy of their training in terms of um, a clinical result. Uh, with, that would put it more in the zone of, yes, it needs to be regulated. Yeah, you're right. That's thank you, Walter. That's a good distinction. So it, it would depend if they're if they're making claims about what the um, yeah how the product can improve um, clinical outcomes or something like that. That's that's very true. But if it's because um, there's a lot of companies doing great work on like um, training procedures for surgeons or or things like that, and that um, I think often no. But you're right, it would depend if they were making statements about it um, falling under like improving clinical outcomes or something like that. That's a, that's a good point, thank you. And I suppose this, this is the sort of thing that going to, to the Q submission process um, would help clarify that if a company is concerned that uh, what they're developing, is it something they need to be concerned about review or not? that there's a process to answer that question at the very beginning and mm -hmm. uh, yeah absolutely so it's it's a really good resource um and it and depending on the the specific question it, it might be something that could be answered i think quite quickly um by the review offices okay um do we have any other questions from the audience if so, please put them in the um, Q&A section. Well, there's one, co one question. Uh, what are the contact details to learn more about MedVR? Stephen, I'll let you jump in to answer that. Uh, that's, uh, that's easy. Um, you can visit uh, medvr.io, uh, and if you um, and I'll put it in the chat. Uh, if um, uh, if you want to email me directly, it's Stephen with a V uh, at uh, medvr.io. Fantastic, and Brian, I, I want to thank you and uh, your colleagues for. Um, uh, your hard work and very important work uh, helping us as we develop uh, um, new uh, emerging products for, for healthcare. Um, it, it's wonderful to know there's an, uh, a group out there that both is, you know, helping us keep things safe, helping us understand what's effective, but also uh, being, being uh, friendly and reaching out and trying to make the process uh, um, manageable and not arduous, uh, uh, especially in this zone of uh, uh, clinical VR, where many of the companies are not uh, large, uh, well-funded pharma or medical device companies, although uh, wonderfully enough, there are many of those uh, moving into the clinical area. But I, I think the preponderance right now are groups that are in spinning out of an academic uh, uh, group or very early stage companies that have yet to have the experience of going through the process. So your help to help us understand um, uh, what to do. And, and your hard work here is, is very much appreciated. Thank you. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting area and there's a lot of great work going on from different companies. And it's, you know, it's fun to see what the developments are. And I think having some of these kind of community discussions to try to keep the communication open, yeah, it's really valuable to, I think, move these technologies forward. Yeah. Steve, thank you for bringing us together and putting this event on. I really very much appreciate it. Yeah. Th uh, thank you, Walter. Th and, and thank you, Ryan, for, uh, uh, for coming and, and talking about it. Uh, one thing I, I will recommend everybody who's interested, um, uh, in 2019, the FDA had an in-person community meeting, um, uh, wh which included um, uh, people working in the field, people interested in the field, and, and experts. Uh, it, the recordings are on their, their website. 
Uh, and it's a, a very good overview of the field and, and how um, uh, the FDA uh, was thinking uh, back in 2019, uh, uh, which was very pro-community, uh, uh, pro-innovator um, uh, and, and researcher. Uh, and uh, they, they've advanced since then, but it's, um, it's still uh, a, a, a pandemic later, it's, uh, it, it's, it's still extremely relevant. So on, on that, I'll, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna wrap, wrap this up. Uh, I'm gonna thank everybody for coming. The video should be on, on our website in about a week. Um, I posted in the chat uh, the link to the presentation and that will be with, with the video as well. Uh, we uh, are working on a couple more, more talks. I don't have one to uh, announce just yet. Uh, but it's um, uh, it, it it looks like it's going to be be ex as extremely interesting um, uh, to everyone. There'll be plenty of aha moments uh, like there was uh, uh, was today. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for putting together the presentation and giving it. And and Walter, thanks for your uh, expert moderating. Have a great uh, great day and week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.